All right, it is one o'clock, so we will go ahead and get started. Uh, I am Alice Neckler. I am the communications um, with the communications office with the Office of Science. Um, thank you for joining us today for this informational webinar on the Early Career Research Program. Um, a few logistics before we begin. Um, this meeting is being recorded, and that recording will be posted to our website. I'll drop the website in the chat so you have that link. Um, the slides from today will also be posted on that same website. Again, I'll, I'll post that in the chat for you so you can follow up with that uh, after the webinar. Um, let's see. There are closed captions available. If you click on the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen, um, that will enable them for you. Uh, we also are taking questions. At the end of the session, we'll be using the Q&A box. So uh, you'll see the Q&A box again at the bottom of your screen. If you go ahead and drop your question in there, we'll get to it if we have time, uh, or we may answer it during the session if we are able to. Um, and I think that is it. So I will hand it over to John. Thank you, Alison. Uh, good morning or uh, afternoon. I'm John Mandrakas, the Office of Science Coordinator uh, of the Early Career Research Program. And I'm giving this webinar on behalf of the Early Career Working Group. Now, a couple of important things first before we start. We'll try to be as accurate as possible in the information we provide today. But please keep in mind that the defining document for this solicitation is the funding opportunity announcement, the FOA document itself. Also, please pay attention to the deadlines, including the time zones. Uh, we normally don't accept late uh, submissions, so make sure that you don't miss any of the upcoming uh, deadlines. Going to the next slide, please. So I'll start with a short background of the Early Career Research Program. It started in 2010, so this is the 15th uh, year of the program. And the purpose of the program is to support out outstanding scientists during the early part of their careers when many scientists do their most formative work. And by doing so, to also stimulate research in the area supported uh, by the Office of Science. And the mission of the Office of Science, as you can see, if you go to uh, the Office of Science website, is to support outstanding, it's to deliver the scientific discoveries and major scientific tools to transform our understanding of nature and advance the energy, economic, and national security of the United States. We are the nation's largest federal sponsor of basic research in the physical sciences and uh, the lead federal agency supporting uh, fundamental scientific research related to energy. Diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, DEIA, uh, is a very important uh, aspect of this program. We'll say something more about it later. And finally, I should mention that the Office of Science, the Office of Science candidates for the prestigious Presidential Early Career Awards for Scientists and Engineers, PKs, are selected from uh, the Early Career Awardees. Uh, next slide, please. So as you can see, we invite applications in all areas supported by the Office of Science. Now, representatives from all the programs listed on this page are here today to answer your questions. Go to the next slide. Uh, now, this slide is about eligibility. We accept applications from assistant or associate professors in tenure track positions at US academic institutions and from full-time non-postdoctoral employees at DOE national laboratories and Office of Science scientific user facilities that happen to be uh, not to be at the DOE lab. And this actually applies to only two uh, facilities. Now, to address uh, challenges uh, due to the pandemic, uh, last year we extended uh, eligibility from 10 to 12 years since the PhD and we are continuing this uh, extension uh, for this year. Our plan uh, is to go back to the original 10-year eligibility uh, next year in 2025. So this means that uh, for the present competition, those who received doctorates on or after uh, January 1st of 2011 are eligible to apply. 
So we have some additional extensions of eligibility due to major live, uh, live events, and uh, you can find more information about uh, these extensions in the FOA document. And finally, uh, you can apply up to three times to, to this program. Uh, and if you have any additional questions about eligibility, there is an email address here, the SC Early, Career, uh, Early at Science DOE uh, GOV, uh, and we, we'll be happy to um, answer your questions. Now, uh, the next slide, please. Uh, this is about uh, this slide is about funding levels. Uh, the early career awards are made for five years. Now, the minimum request for awards to institutions of higher education is uh, 875,000 uh, over five years. Uh, uh, the the minimum was raised last year in 2023 to encourage uh, these institutions to increase graduate student stipends. And you can find more information about this in the living wages uh, section in the FOA. Uh, this year, we also increased the minimum award to the labs from uh, 2.5 million for five years to uh, 2.75 uh, million. This is an increase by 250K. Now, for uh, DOE National Laboratories, we, ex we encourage, strongly encourage uh, the PIs to cover at least 50% of, of the PI salary. And if, it, if it's not 50% and above, to be as close as possible to 50%. For the Office of Science user facilities that are not at the DOE lab, uh, they, uh, the candidates should uh, use the guidance for the DOE labs. Now, historically, the average award uh, for both institutions of higher education and DOE labs has been close to the minimum uh, for its institutional type. However, we can consider requests for uh, awards larger uh, than the historical average with uh, some justification. So please, uh, next slide, please. This slide is about the uh, promoting inclusive and equitable research plan or the peer plan. This is uh, something that started last year for all Office of Science proposals, including proposals to the early career program. Uh, so all proposals should include a, a peer plan. And this plan reflects our commitment, the Office of Science commitment to uh, DEIA. Uh, and we added an additional criterion uh, to the merit review criteria uh, on the quality and efficacy of the plan for promoting inclusive and uh, equitable research. And if you go to uh, the FOA, you can uh, see uh, the uh, sub criteria under this uh, criterion that uh, the, the peer reviewers would have to uh, answer. And I encourage all of you to go to this uh, Office of Science page about the peer plan uh, to get more information when you uh, prepare your proposals. Going to the next uh, page, please. No, I thought uh, you would be interested in seeing some statistics about the program. Uh, we've made 961 awards since the inception of the program. Uh, 624 went to universities, 337 to national labs. And during the last few years, we've been averaging about uh, uh, more than 1,000 pre-applications and uh, more than uh, 600 full applications. Uh, the overall success rate across all program offices is uh, about 14%, but please understand that this varies by program office. To give you an idea about what we did last year, uh, we made 93 awards, uh, 60 to universities, 33 to national labs, for a total of 68 million of 2023 funding, 135 million the five-year total. Uh, and this went to 47 distinct universities and 12 uh, distinct national laboratories in 27 states. And if you go to the uh, early career webpage, you can see abstracts of all uh, awards made since the beginning of the program. This is actually a good resource uh, if you want to see uh, the types of uh, research that we, we fund. Uh, next slide, please. I'm not going to spend any time on this slide. Th these are more uh, data. Uh, this file would be available uh, to you. So you can uh, see the uh, award statistics uh, uh, by uh, program office. Uh, this 
that could be of interest to you. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. So now the next few slides uh, include program specific information and will be uh, the, will be presented by uh, the program office uh, representatives. Uh, so we start with the Office of Advanced Scientific Computing Research, uh, Ashley. Great. Thank you, John. Uh, in the ECRP for the Advanced Scientific Computing Research, there's a total of six topics that fall within our three program areas. The six topics are meant to be self Can you uh, advance a slide, please? <laughs> yeah. The six topics uh, are meant to be self-descriptive, and the FOA lists the assigned program manager to contact for follow-up questions. Within applied mathematics, the first topic is in extreme-scale algorithms for scientific computing, and Stephen Lee is the contact there. The, the second topic is in multi-scale mathematics from modeling and simulation of complex systems, and the program manager is William Spots. Within computer science, we have a topic on systems, and that emphasizes programming, system software, and performance portability and Hal Finkel is the contact. And the second topic is data management, visualization, analytic methods, and the program manager is Margaret Lentz, who's here with us today. And also we have advanced computing technologies. And there we have a topic on quantum computing that has an emphasis on noise modeling, characterization and control, and the contact is Claire Kramer. And the second topic there is in emerging computing technologies, and that's focused on neuromorphic computing, and Robinson Pino is the contact. The FOA lists various research areas that are out of scope and cites reference material to provide further information and context. You can see things there. Thank you. Next slide. Hi, everyone. Andy Schwartz here from the Office of Basic Energy Sciences, um, BES in our, in our lingo. Um, shown here on this slide, and I will not read all of this to you. I apologize. This is a large program, a uh, large large program within the Office of Science, and we have many sub-programs, which are listed here. Uh, they're grouped into three uh, divisions, the Chemical Sciences, Geosciences, and Biosciences Division, the Material Sciences and Engineering Division, and a Scientific User Facilities Division. And we have sub-programs within each of those divisions um, uh, in which we are soliciting proposals. If you look at the funding opportunity announcement itself, you will find uh, individual program manager contact information for each one of those sub-program areas, as well as descriptions of each one of those areas. So I as I said, I will not go through each one of them, but I will point out a couple of changes uh, this year relative to prior year early career uh, research program funding opportunity announcements. Uh, the first one I'll point out um, in both the chemical sciences, geosciences, and biosciences division and the material sciences and engineering division is that we have added, it's about halfway down the list under the chemical sciences division, a quantum information sciences in the CSGB program. And similarly, about two thirds of the way down the list uh, in the middle, a quantum information sciences in material sciences. So these are we have been supporting quantum information sciences across our divisions as sort of a cross-cutting topic in recent years. This year, those topics are called out as individual programs. Um, I'll also point out that under scientific user facilities, uh, and this applies, of course, to those uh, on the on the webinar who are at DOE lab user facilities <clears throat> supported by BES, uh, we have a topic that is been lumped together, instrumentation and technique development for BES user facilities. And that includes the X-ray light sources, the neutron facilities, and the nano centers, where in past years, uh, those were independent topics. Um, in addition, we're continuing the accelerator and detector research topic. And then in the right box on the lower right are some cross-cutting areas that we feel apply to really all of our programs and are worth considering as you put together your pre-application pre and potential application. Next slide, please. Uh, hello, uh, I am Shaima Nasri. Uh, I am one of the program managers for the BER topic. BER has two topics uh, this year. Um, I'm going to hand off uh, to my uh, colleague Pablo to describe the first. All right. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Pablo Rabinovic. I'm the technical contact for the Biological System Science Division topic in the early career an opportunity announcement. And uh, the topic this year is systems biology enable microbiome research to facilitate predictions of interactions and behavior in the environment. If you have applied before to the biological system science topic, please read careful, carefully this year's topic because it is different from previous years. We change from year to year to accommodate all the, the programs of relevance for our division. I also um, wanted to um, emphasize that uh, this topic is about microbiome research. 
particularly in the roles of these microbiomes in the global, and, and I emphasize global biogeochemical uh, cycles and um, in soil terrestrial environments. So uh, please read carefully uh, the description of the topic as well as the uh, scroll down to the section uh, of topics uh, not within scope, because if you, um, if your, your pre-application is focused on uh, one of those not in scope topics, uh, you will try not be encouraged to submit a full proposal. And finally, I just wanted to emphasize to keep scrolling after that and read the section on user facilities and resources that are available to you, particularly the Joint Genome Institute, which has a program specifically for applicants uh, to early career. Thank you. All right, and the Earth and Environmental System Sciences topic this year for BER is Southeast U.S. Atmospheric Processes um, uh, through uh, use of observations from the ARM facility at Bankhead National Forest um, Atmospheric Observatory. And as Pablo said, this topic is different from previous uh, year's topics. The requirement uh, for uh, ARM observations from the BNF site to be integral is strict and critical for responsiveness. Uh, atmospheric processes of relevance are listed in the FOA. Thank you. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, the Fusion Energy Sciences Program, the mission of our program is to develop the science needed for uh, a fusion energy source, uh, but also we support uh, more broadly uh, plasma discovery, plasma science in, in general. Our program areas cover uh, almost the entire scope of our program. They range from research focused on fusion energy, uh, research on uh, magnetic fusion in tokamaks and stellarators, inertial fusion energy, theory and simulation, advanced diagnostics. This is the measurement innovation program, uh, fusion materials and fusion nuclear science, and also research focused on discovery plasma science, uh, like general plasma science, experiment and theory, and high energy density science. Also, we all support uh, research on cross-cutting areas, uh, like uh, uh, artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning. And feel free to contact the program managers listed on this slide uh, to get more information about uh, specific uh, uh, priorities in each of, of these topical areas. Uh, thank you. Next slide. Uh, the, high the Office of High Energy Physics, uh, the mission of the High Energy Physics program is to understand how the universe works at its most fundamental level. And we do this by discovering the most elementary constituents of matter and energy, exploring the basic nature of space and time itself, and probing the interactions between them. Uh, we have eight research programs in the early career program this year. Uh, the three experimental frontiers, the energy frontier, which uses particle beams at the highest energies, the intensity frontier, uh, which uses particle beams of very high intensity to look at the uh, rare processes. The cosmic frontier, which uh, involves observational and other non-accelerator uh, experimental uh, efforts, uh, theoretical high-energy physics, um, accelerator science and technology R&D, detector research and development, and two areas that are new to HEP, to the early career program this year from HEP is computational research in high-energy physics and quantum information science and high energy physics. Uh, these last three programs in particular could have significant overlap with the uh, experimental frontiers or theory and accelerator science. And so you're if you're interested in these, uh, you're encouraged to contact the program managers listed here, uh, as well as the program managers from the uh, experimental or theoretical areas that are most closely associated to be where uh, would be most appropriate for the research you're interested in uh, performing. So. Uh, Next slide. Hi, this is Piros Margeris from Nuclear Physics. Nuclear Physics he studies the nuclear matter and their actual at all scales, the composition, the formation, and also the behavior of nuclear matter at all temperatures, essentially up to several trillion degrees. We have uh, nine areas here. We have some accelerator physics R&D that includes also uh, AI NML, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning for uh, accelerator operations. Uh, the computational physics that uses, uh, does research in uh, high performance computers. 
fundamental symmetries, which is basically the neutrino physics and also new forces and uh, questions, fundamental questions about the universe and symmetries. The heavy ions, which is essentially studying the behavior on nuclear matter and the high energy at high uh, temperatures and high energies. Medium energy, which is uh, studying nuclear matter and the strong force at uh, lower energies, so the low part of uh, the temperatures. Nuclear structure and nuclear astrophysics with a diverse portfolio, essentially nucleosynthesis and uh, other things. The quantum information science, which is uh, a couple of, of years old, actually uh, relevant to nuclear science. We, for example, I can give you its uh, sensors or uh, uh, beam dynamics through quantum uh, techniques or even uh, uh, shielding from cosmic rays of uh, the qubits. Uh, the theory, the theory is the, essentially spans everything else, you know, is the theoretical work that supports uh, all the fields. And then at the end is the nuclear data, which uh, supports the nuclear data program of the uh, US. Thank you. Next. I'm Mark Marsh uh, with the Accelerator R&D and Production Office, RDAP. Uh, we've heard Accelerator several times in some of the other offices. RDAP is specifically cross-cutting. Uh, so if your topic falls specifically into nuclear physics, high energy physics, or isotope program, uh, or, or serves the user facilities of that particular office, your, your application should be going there. Uh, if it serves more than one office, um, RDAP may be where, where it lands. Uh, we're looking for people who can really bridge the gap between basic research and industrial production. Um, and what that means for an early career applicant is really that we, again, are looking for people who can bridge uh, R&D and industry. And we expect a significant portion of, of your proposal uh, to engage with domestic technology companies. Uh, the topics themselves are listed here. I won't go through and repeat them all in detail, but they are in the FOA. Um, they span uh, superconducting accelerator technologies and magnets, uh, computation software for design and control, particle sources, RF sources, even lasers, um, as well as advanced materials and, and again, software for, for advanced computation. Uh, the points of contact are myself, Rourke Marsh, as well as Eric Colby. Um, and again, we're, we're looking for sort of cross-cutting um, applications. Thank you. Next slide. Next slide. Good morning or afternoon. Uh, I'm Ethan Balkin. I am the program manager for uh, R&D within the DOE Isotope program. DOE Isotope program has a multi-pronged mission to first produce and distribute radioisotopes and enrich stable isotopes that are in short supply. Two, to maintain the required infrastructure to enable production and processing. Three, to conduct R&D on new and improved isotope production and processing techniques. Four, to build up the related workforce. And five, to ensure robust domestic supply chains to reduce U.S. dependency on foreign supplies and ensure national preparedness. Uh, the four um, research areas that are identified within the DOE isotope programs topical area are largely the same as those that have appeared in years past. However, there has been some restructuring and some combination. Um, I believe in years past, you've seen probably five subtopics. I would encourage uh, any potential applicants to take a look at the, uh, the restructured topics, see what has changed, what might, might remain the same, and uh, as always, good practice uh, details uh, um, uh, contacting the program manager uh, to ensure responsiveness, uh, whether that is one or both of our, our uh, uh, listed program managers. We're both willing to uh, engage with prospective uh, principal investigators. Thank you. Uh, next slide. Uh, this, uh, thank you all. This is the last slide of the presentation. So just to repeat, uh, as I said in the very beginning, uh, the FOA document is the authoritative source for this competition, and this is a link to, to the FOA. Uh, we are also planning to post a frequently asked questions document. Uh, 
uh, we actually may add some of your questions. Uh, so that should be uh, posted in the next few days. And if you still have questions, you can, uh, if your question is about program rules or eligibility, then you should send your question to the SC uh, early uh, science DOE gov email address. Uh, if you have questions about uh, specific topical areas, then you should e email uh, the program manager listed under its uh, topical area. Uh, thank you again, and uh, we're open uh, to, uh, to uh, questions. I, I, I can see that uh, some, a lot of questions have been answered already, uh, but uh, Alison, uh, back to you. All right, thank you. All right, we do have um, a lot of questions that were answered during the presentation, um, but we do have a few that we can answer here. Uh, so first question, uh, past awarded abstracts do, do not specify which program funded them, only shows BES, uh, Oscar versus. Um, are there any statistical information about number of awards for each program? Are there set limits for each program for this year? Yeah, as I saw in my uh, slide, if, if I understood the question, uh, question uh, correctly, uh, first of all, I thought that uh, the abstracts they do at, at the bottom of the page, they do list the program office, but uh, nevertheless, uh, in uh, the uh, my slides, I had uh, stati I mean, I had information for all awards made uh, since the inception of the program uh, by its program office. So, and uh, no, uh, the, the second question, the, the number of awards depends on uh, its uh, uh, program office, on the funding that they have in this particular area, depends on the strength of the proposal. So no, we don't have a set number of awards. I mean, uh, I believe 2022, we made 83 awards, 2023, although we increase the funding level for uh, universities, one would have expected that we would make uh, we would have made fewer awards, but actually we made more awards, 93 awards. So I don't think that there is uh, uh, that there isn't a set number of awards. It all depends on the funding uh, availability and the strength of the proposals. All right, thank you. Um, I know you've said this, but let's go over it again. Are there any limits on how many times people can apply? Three. We said this, uh, this is clearly stated in the FOA uh, three, three times, and only uh, the uh, submission of a full proposal counts, uh, not the pre-applications. Uh, is it okay to seek collaborations with the national labs if the proposals are going out from the universities? Uh, do we need to allocate a budget for that? Well, uh, first of all, this the early career uh, research program uh, Proposals should have a single PI, uh, not co-PIs. Uh, so uh, having said that, uh, the uh, expectation is to have graduate students or postdocs or other early career scientists. So um, a collaboration with uh, a more senior scientist, uh, I think it's possible, but it's not something that is encouraged. Uh, I, I invite my colleagues from the other program offices to uh, comment on this and uh, Mike uh, Zarkin. So this is Andy Schwartz from BES. I, I can uh, weigh in a little. I, I, it's certainly not a requirement. Uh, so I think one of the questions we had asked if it was required, the answer is clearly no. Um, you, you know, collaborations with whatever um, other researchers in your field, uh, if you feel they strengthen your application, uh, can be considered. Um, but I think the institutional location of those collaborators is not the primary, uh, shouldn't be the primary driver, it should be the expertise and the capabilities that they bring to your project. Thank you. Uh, lots of questions. Um, my research area fits into two programs in BES. Should I choose one program or is it possible to submit the proposal for the consideration by multiple programs? Okay, I'll answer that. I think you should decide uh, which one you think it has the uh, the strongest um, uh, uh, alignment with and submit to that program. That said, we do review the pre-applications and, and among other things, one of the things we look at is the, is the fit and we can and sometimes do transfer a pre uh, pre application from one program to another 
uh, either within BES or even potentially, and it does happen sometimes between the programs, for example, from BES to BER, if, if, vice versa, if we feel there is a, a better alignment elsewhere. So we do look at the pre-applications carefully and try to make sure that they're evaluated by the program where we feel they have the strongest alignment. And, and transfer is is possible on this end. But in terms of your submission, I would I would encourage you to submit to the program where you feel you have the strongest alignment. Thank you. Uh, from a program manager perspective, how would you like to be approached regarding a potential submission? A white paper or one pager or the basic idea? Um, is that required or viewed positively? Uh, I'm not sure if I can answer this for uh, the entire Ops of Science, but uh, at least for us, the pre-application is the, uh, in essence, the equivalent of the white paper. Yeah. And and I will uh, uh, pitch it, uh, uh, jump in for BER and just say that uh, we do not want to pre-review and will not pre-review your pre-application. Um, if you have a specific question, um, then you know we are absolutely happy to to answer it. But if you are are asking us uh, if something is clearly responsive, we will not be able to answer that until you submit the pre-application. Yeah, and I would I would echo that from BE, BES as well. Um, as you've seen with some of the numbers John presented, that the volume, particularly for a large program like BES, is quite large. And for for equity, equity we want to be equitable. We want to be able to give. It's very difficult to be able to give everybody that same level of feedback in the time desired to time allowed. So, as Shema said, we we uh, the pre application is your opportunity uh, to uh, convince us that of the alignment uh, and um, scientific merits of your proposed research, and that's when we use to do that assessment. I'll pile on in the same vein and say that again, we we consider the pre application the white paper please don't send us a white paper. We will not be able to comment on the specifics. We'll have to give you that sort of 10,000 foot advice, which again, will be very equitable and, and pretty much what the fellow says. Right. I think that probably answers a lot of the questions that we have um, in the, in the Q&A box. Um, can we have a budget? Can we include budget for consultations with foreign companies? Well, there is language in the FOA, but uh, we support uh, uh, international collaborations. Uh, so uh, if this is part of international collaboration, yeah, that uh, is cert certainly is acceptable. I'm not sure what uh, you mean by consultation, uh, but if it's uh, a uh, collaboration with uh, a foreign institution or uh, PI, uh, I think that this is allowed. All right. Um, can instrumentation be included in the budget, or are there any limitations? Uh, I think this is fine. It depends. I mean, if it's uh, needed uh, for uh, the proposed research, uh, certainly it's a uh, allowable expense. Mm -hmm. um, I have a pre-application to a regular core program that has been encouraged to move on to full proposal. Is it allowed or encouraged to submit the same to the early career research program? Um, well, obviously, we cannot fund uh, the same uh, project uh, twice. Uh, so uh, I believe, again, I invite my colleagues to clarify this, but I believe it's OK. But, but uh, when we decide to make uh, a award, we're going to look at both and uh, we won't fund the uh, duplicate scope. Yeah. yeah, I agree. All right. Um, it's a question about um, grad student stipends. Um, the solicitation states that for graduate students, SC considers a reasonable living wage to be annual income of $45,000 excluding benefits. Does this include the tuition that the project will pay for the grad students? For example, if our university requires um, $11,000 for tuition annually, should we assign $34,000 for their salary per year or is 45K uh, only the salary? Yeah, let, let me try to answer it and then perhaps- if you, want, if you want me to, I can. 
So, so go ahead, Mike. Okay. The statement in the funding opportunity announcement is an encouragement and a statement of principle from the department's senior most leadership. The Department of Energy lacks the authority to impose either a salary cap or a minimum wage under its financial assistance awards. We can, though, encourage applicants and recipients to investigate their policies and procedures to see how the objective of a living wage may be achieved. The cost principles of 2 CFR 200 are applicable to all awards, requiring the consistent treatment of costs, regardless of the source of funding. The sum of $45,000 refers to annualized income, exclusive of benefits, including tuition remission. But it is unenforceable and an encouragement to provide a living wage. Thank you, Mike. This is very clear. That's, that was really helpful. Um, how are proposals reviewed and selected? Well, its program uh, has its own approach. Uh, some programs have panels, uh, panel reviews. Others uh, have mail-in reviews. Uh, others have a combination of both. Uh, but uh, normally, a proposal is reviewed by at least three uh, peer reviewers. Um, and uh, uh, also, we take into account the program policy factors uh, when we make selections. Okay. Um, can we submit multiple pre-applications to different programs uh, and based on the review, uh, submit one full proposal? Uh, I don't think that this is allowed. Going through. Um, right, so we answered the uh, you cannot submit more than you, you can you submit two different pre applications to one program or two programs? Didn't we just answer these? Or yes. is I'm just confirming that's that was oh, okay. yeah. Okay. And marking questions as we go. Um, all right. When we submit the pre-application, should we expect to wait until March to receive the feedback or is feedback sent earlier? Um I think, well, this may also be program specific. Are you are you talking about the official discards or and cards? Uh, if, if this is the case, then uh, we normally try all the programs to respond at the same time, around the same time, but uh, I'm, I'm not sure if this is a uh, requirement. Um, but if, uh, if, if the question is about the feedback, uh, you know, some programs, they, they have an internal process, uh, reviewing uh, the pre-applications for uh, co competitiveness. And I believe that uh, the comments for, for, for these reviews are sent after the funding decisions. Uh, maybe BES or Oscar can clarify since my program doesn't do this. So. I think that's right. It's, it's going to be around when the um, decision deadline is. It could be a little bit earlier, though. Yeah. I but it so was about the merit review. I don't think merit review is. is uh, 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 made available to applicants, but we also don't use it. So I think BES may may know better. Yeah. So that uh, that that comment was only for BER. That doesn't apply to BES, I guess. So we we do uh, we do for programs that receive large volumes do a, a comparative review of the pre applications. Uh, the details are in the funding opportunity announcement of the criteria that are used, um, and then the recommendations are based on that. We also state in the FOA that upon request, you can uh, um, request feedback on that merit review um, at a later date after the awards have been announced. So for the integrity of the process, that information doesn't go out uh, during the process, but once we've finalized the award process, the uh, applicants, pre-applicants can request feedback on their uh, pre-proposal. 
And and just to clarify, uh, by March 14, what the applicants will receive is just a uh, encourage or discourage uh, through PAMS. So there won't be any additional information in this, or why it's discarded, or why it's encouraged. Okay. Uh, so we've got, there's a list of the merit review criteria. Um, that is is um, in the funding opportunity announcement. Um, are these criteria equally weighted? Um, how are they distributed, or is that a program by prog program decision? I, I think the language is, uh, uh, and Mike can correct me, is in uh, uh, decrease priority order. Uh, I believe that's how we uh, list them. Okay. Exactly. All right. Pass awarded abstracts do not specify. Oh, did we do that one? Yes, we did that one. Okay. Sorry. Um, so I have a, a BER wetland soils question here. Um, I, I answered that didn't didn't. Okay, uh, did, did it get answered? Um, they have been submitted twice. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. I, I can answer it. Uh, wetlands and sure. uh, wetlands and um, permafrost soils are within scope as long as they address uh, global uh, biogeochemical cycles. I think I think there was a follow up question to see if there was any oh. difference between uh, coastal wetlands and uh, inland freshwater. Wetlands. So coastal um, is is um, uh, environments are are not uh, within scope actually. So we should uh, I would encourage to read carefully the the not within scope uh, section, and if if that is not clear, reach out to me. Thank you. Um. Let's see. We answered this one. Um, we talked a little. Uh, we talked about the the national lab collaboration. Um, I, so, can we allocate funding for collaborators collaborators from national labs or other university researchers? If so, how much can be allocated? I believe we answered a similar type of question before. Uh, early career applications should not have copy eyes, but if uh, uh, help from uh, contributions from uh, outside uh, experts is uh, necessary, uh, then they can be included. Uh, even You can even include unfunded funded collaborators. There is a letter uh, format uh, in uh, in the FOA uh, that uh, uh, people uh, can include. Uh, I, there are any there, there is some guidance about a fraction of the budget and so on. I mean, people should submit the budget that they need to to carry out the work that they propose. And again, I invite my colleagues uh, if they have any uh, additional input uh, to this question. Um, could you qual qual clarify the following statement? And I believe this is probably for Andy. Um, for DOE national laboratory applicants, the proposed research must fit within the BES, chemical sciences, geosciences, and biosciences division funded programs at the laboratory of the applicant. Does that mean that there um, should be an FWP under the specific topic in the lab? Yeah, that's a good question. And that that statement, you'll find that statement under all of our programs for the material sciences division. It'll obviously reference the MSC material sciences division, but that, that's a statement that we have included um, and it's interpreted fairly broadly. So I think the answer, the specific answer to the last question, does that mean that there should be an FWP under that specific topic? Not necessarily, but what we want to ensure, I'll tell you the reason for this, 
Uh, we want to ensure that uh, early career projects that we fund are not funded in a vacuum, that there are others at the lab working on similar related topics so that you'll have a sort of ecosystem and environment in which the awardee will be working with collaborators and with potential uh, longer term um, activities beyond the five years of the early career award. An early career award, either to a university or a lab, is a five year award and without the opportunity for a renewal of that award. And so that's the reasoning behind it. So I would encourage you, those, the questioner and anyone else at a DOE lab, to discuss that with your uh, lab leadership before submitting a pre application uh, to ensure that you can, that you believe it fits within the funded programs at the laboratory. Thank you. Uh, this is a, a follow up for Pablo, but I think this is a question that um, some of you might be able to answer, and I think I know the answer. Um, since the VER priorities changed in this fellow, can you comment on the objectives for next year? I'm, I'm happy to comment on that quickly, Pablo. Yeah, or I could follow up afterwards. So um it, it depends on the division um one tends to rotate uh such that uh, each focus area is uh solicited every two years the other one um each is solicited every three years um but uh this can always change based on needs and and budgets so it's not really possible for us to comment on 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 what may be uh coming up uh, Shima or Pablo, would you like to provide any more input on that? Uh, I would also just add to that uh, there are the budget constraints and such, but it all it's also um, uh, questions of equity um, in that we do not uh, typically uh, um, uh, announce our funding opportunity, our specific funding opportunity announcements um, before they are released to ensure that everyone has the same opportunity to respond um, within BER. The uh, environmental system sciences uh, division. Uh, we rotate, we have been for the last few cycles rotating our topics every three years. Um, this year it is an atmosphere topic. Last year was a modeling topic and the, uh, uh, I believe that was the case. Um, and then it uh, rotates between modeling, um, atmosphere and um, environmental system science. Just briefly for, for the biological system, system science division, we also try to rotate topics to cover all the, the areas of interest for the, for, for the division. Uh, however, that it, sometimes it's, it is not possible to do it in a regular fashion. So um, there are some flexibilities there. So we cannot uh, uh, comment on, on future FOAs. We will just have to, to keep an eye on our funding opportunities. Uh, Web page and I will uh, encourage everybody to sign up for Gov Delivery so you get all uh, up-to-date information on any uh, FOAs or other information from the other science that you you select in your preferences. And I will Allison, Allison, if I could just comment from the BES Please. perspective, because we also, I think that question may have been directed to BER, but we also have a number of programs in BES that, that rotate topics. Uh, and my, it, it, like my BER colleagues, we can't uh, predict what will be in the future, so we won't talk about future FOAs, but all past funding opportunity announcements are still available on our website, so you can also look backwards and see what topics. It doesn't necessarily predict what will be in the future, but you can see what, what has been rotated in and out in, in prior years, and I encourage you to look for those. They're under a closed funding opportunity announcement on the same site where the current one is listed. Great, and that's actually, that was the follow-up next question was, uh, where can I find information about what topics uh, will be preferred or discouraged in the upcoming years? And I think you guys just answered that really well. And I think that applies for everyone, correct? The, we don't advertise what we're doing in the future, but you rotate between topics. Okay. Um, all right. Um, for the peer plan um, that's listed in, as a criteria uh, in the bulleted list in the funding opportunity announcement, um, how much weight does it carry and are there any common pitfalls in that area of the proposal to avoid for the peer plans? Well, uh, as I said, uh, uh, this is an important aspect of the program. Uh, however, 
we cannot offer, I mean, it's very difficult to answer this question, but uh, I would recommend that they go to the uh, Office of Science uh, website. We have a link on the peer program. Uh, and uh, th there is a lot of information uh, in uh, in this website uh, about pitfalls and so on. I, again, I don't know how to answer this question. If anyone else wants to provide an answer, please go ahead. I would say that the most common pitfall is that the institutional plan is copied, whether it's your national laboratory or university. Um, there's no attempt to make it tailored to the research itself. Um, the most common pitfall we've seen is that, or not having it, which again is yes, this is yeah. important. Yeah, it would be surprising how many people forget uh, not only the peer plan but also the uh, the data management plan uh, that is also mandatory. And if it's not included, we are forced to decline the proposal without a review. Just so you please, could you restate uh, for everyone on the call um, whether uh, applicants should get in touch with um, or or have, can they ask questions of the um, program managers um, about their submissions beforehand? They, I mean, the reason we include the, the contact information is for uh, potential applicants to uh, contact uh, the program manager if they had a particular question. But as others stated, this this is not an invitation for people to submit white papers or other information uh, waiting for uh, feedback. We don't provide that kind of feedback outside the pre-application process. But if they, they have a question whether, uh, you know, if, if the language in one of the topical areas is not very clear and they don't know whether the idea fits exactly with uh, the uh, the topical area, then they certainly are encouraged to uh, contact the program managers. But the program managers cannot give advice of what topics to include or not include or how to write a proposal and so on. We can only clarify things. Thank you. Um, do you have any specific guidance for user facilities? Uh, will they be treated any differently from national labs? Uh, if the question is about the uh, extension of the eligibility to all Office of Science user facilities, no, there is nothing uh, different. I mean, every proposal would be uh, treated like uh, any other uh, proposal. Uh, so, but I'm not sure if I understood uh, the, the question, but. Uh, but no, there's no difference between uh, proposals from user facilities or DOE labs or universities. They all treated the same. I think that's the question. Yeah. Um... Well, Alison, I'll, there's one here. I'll, I'll yeah. just jump in. I, we've, we've sort of answered this already, but I just want to clarify. There's another question about directed to BES, but it applies to everybody. Can I submit? Oops, it just jumped. Sorry. Can I submit? Several pre-applications under different topics. Uh, the answer and and uh, the answer is no. Uh, um, well, I'm reading the language in the FOA. It's in section uh, 3D, I think, limitation on submissions, and it clearly says that one pre-application per PI is allowable. So that that applies across the FOA um, uh, in a given in a given year. Yes. Thank you. Um, okay. So I think we've answered a lot of these questions in different ways. I'm looking for other questions that we haven't answered. All right, I think We've answered a lot of these. Um, there was a question about um, the questions. Um, John, are, are we, um, do you wanna talk about the Q&A document? Yeah, what, what about, what about? Well, the, it's available. It not yet, updated. it's not available, but it will be available. Uh, as I said, we'll review the questions that were submitted today and maybe we can uh, edit it or uh, add additional questions, but uh, 
uh, at least my plan is to post it, uh, if not this week, uh, by early next week. And that document will be available on the Early Career website, and I'm going to put that in the chat. Yeah, or under the uh, uh, FYA announcement, that, that's where we put it last time. Okay. Uh, so it should be available in in both those places, I think, or just to clarify, even the uh, uh, this document, the Q&A document, again, because last year we had some uh, confusion because uh, depending on how people read something, uh, they said, well, there is a uh, uh, disagreement between the uh, uh, Q&A document and the FOA, just to repeat uh, for the third time, but the FOA is the defining document. If uh, anything contradicts the FOA, the FOA wins. So that's it's important yes. to keep in mind. Yes, that is the ruling document. Yep. Um, all right. Here's a, a just a, a question. Probably maybe Andy can answer this. Is EPSCOR funding allocated as part of the early career research program? So we 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 have historically used EPSCOR funding for early career awards, and we uh, we always reserve the right to do that. So uh, we've um, we, um, so if there are applicants from, there's not a separate funding opportunity, the applicants come in through this funding opportunity. And if we, we review them all together, and if, if, uh, the strongest that we intend to award are from EPSCOR jurisdictions, we, uh, we, we do consider the use of EPSCOR funds. That's true across all the programs, uh, as well. We can use those EPSCOR funds. EPSCOR program is managed primarily out of BES, but actually it's on behalf of the whole department and, and we have funded EPSCOR early career, EPSCOR mm -hmm. funded early career awards across various programs in past years. But it's competed through the same BOA using the same criteria and those decisions are made at the time of the award. The decisions about the source of the funds are made at the time of the award. All right, um, I think that's the end of um, the questions. Um, I have posted in the chat the um, the URL for where the webinar recording and slides and um, questions document will be posted. It'll be on the um, funding opportunities page on our website uh, under this specific funding opportunity. So you'll find it there. Um, and those will be up uh, the Presentation will probably be up this afternoon. Um, the, excuse me, webinar recording will be up next week. Um, and John, any final closing thoughts? No, I, I just wanted to thank all participants uh, for uh, taking the time to learn more about this very important program of the Office of Science and to also thank you and uh, uh, my colleagues for uh, all the help in uh, putting this together and for answering the questions. Great. Thank you all. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye.